All right, man. Hey, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's exciting that you're doing it. So we were just talking about the, uh, how it's sped up kind of like the business life cycle, business yeah. life cycle, uh, for in the supplement space, do you think that you started when it was still like where in the life cycle was it when you first got into it? Do you think that it was cause supplements have been around forever, but there was a big shift when e-commerce started taking off, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I don't think I, I wouldn't call myself. Yeah. There's like two big main phases. There was like the direct mail. Well, there's three, there's the direct mail era where people, where everything was done through mail. Um, and people made money that way. And you, you look at, you know, ads going to people's houses and, and all that stuff. And people made a lot of money like that. And then there was the TV era where people bought a lot of TV advertising. And that's still, there's still people who do that. I know people who are still doing well like that, but it's, it's a big game, you know, less and less people watch TV, more and more fragmented, you know, all the streaming stuff. And then there was the e-commerce phase. So I think I was probably a late early adopter in the e-commerce wave. Um, not quite like cutting edge early adopter, but I was like, I was fairly early on the e-commerce side. I mean, people were doing it, but it had not got efficient. And then I think over the last nine years, coming up on 10 years that I've been doing it, I think it's now gotten e-commerce, Amazon, Google ads, it's all gotten really efficient. It, it sounds like that might've been the right time, like the perfect time to get in, not too early, because being too early is just as bad as being too late, right? Yeah, yeah, if you're too early, you're wrong, for sure. And I think there's there's technologies like that. Like, there's something I'm super interested in right now. I'm, I'm looking at getting into the regenerative medicine space. Mm -hmm. And we're like, and some of the technologies that are coming out in that space are incredible, but... What is that? So regenerative medicine, uh, and this is this is me getting too far afield, but it, they're, they're a class of, it's a class of not necessarily compounds, but I guess technologies that help the body regenerate itself or use biological tissue to regenerate itself. So it's like they take cells from like a cell. It takes cells from a, a different, you know, living thing. It's no longer alive usually. And they put it into your body or they take your own blood, they spin it and then they take the, uh, the platelet rich plasma and they'll put it like, let's say you're losing your hair. They'll put it on your hairline and your hair will grow back. Or you have like a wound that won't heal. Like you're someone older. Well, they'll put platelets or they'll put an extracellular matrix is what it's called on your, on like a wound that's healing or something like that. And instead of, it's like a, as opposed to being like a surgeon who has to use kind of a blunt instrument, it's a very fine instrument because it, it regenerates the body and on its own in some incredible ways. And it's gonna, from what I understand, I'm not a, I'm absolutely not a doctor, but I, I'm friends with some and it just seems like it's gonna change the world. I mean, it seems like it's really gonna change medicine, but there's so much bureaucracy and there's so many people who have vested interests in it not changing and it does things that people have whole specialties dedicated to doing. So anyway, the point, not to get into medicine, but the point is, is that I think that's an example of being maybe on the edge of, too early, whereas supplements, I think I was timed perfectly. I, I would not want to get into that that industry today. It would it's a supplements. Mess. It's a mess. Yeah, it's expensive to get into now, and it's, it's why is it more expensive now? Regulatory costs are higher. Um, uh, advertising costs. That's the main one, though. Advertising costs have just gone up across the board. I mean, they're um, Amazon nickels and dimes now. Their fees have gone up. All, all these tech companies, as the economy is slowing down to try to make, I, my theory is to try to make their earnings, they're taking more from advertisers like me. So Amazon is charging more fees. Like you used to not get charged a storage fees, for example, if you had inventory that was there longer than like 45 days or whatever, I don't know the time, but now they charge for that. They charge more for fulfillment. They charge more, they just take more right off the top as a selling fee. Uh, Google, their traffic's more expensive. They've made it harder to advertise intelligently. Like they're trying to turn it into a black box. Right. Facebook has gone up. Every, so everybody just seems to be trying to nickel and dime the advertiser. And as an e-commerce supplement guy, it's particular, you know, we can feel the pinch from it. And you would have to be so right on and dialed in from the beginning, I don't think, uh, I don't, I don't know how you could be that dialed in unless you've been doing it for so long. We, we like, it's, it's taking a lot of work from us and we've been doing it for 10 years. So I don't know how you could just jump in and try to figure it out. It'd be hard. Yeah. You'd have to, I guess, find a really, really specific niche that has not been exploited yet. Right. Like a, 
Yeah, and people are after. Yeah, but yeah, exactly after. Or you'd have to have a a public presence. I think. Oh, I guess that would make sense, right? You'd, if you had an influencer or something. Yes, an influencer or somebody who started their own brand. That would probably be the influencer thing is dying out too, though. Think so? Well, I just I hear that, or that's what I read is that influencers are not making the money that they used to and it's becoming harder to be an influencer they were i think they were talking about unionizing at some point <laughs> i'm not even kidding like they were going to unionize against facebook uh -huh. and whenever you hear that you're kind of like okay things must not be going so right you know unionizing. they want health care like yeah unionize to take pictures of your breakfast <laughs> like what <laughs> wow so anyway that wow. that's my assumption i don't know for a fact but i i think the influencer space is getting a little it got a little saturated and everything just seems to get saturated fast yeah i guess that's just the acceleration of technology in general right i mean it's made things move so much more quickly it's just just and it's just few like just winner take all in a lot of spaces there's just like few winners who just you know, the people who own open AI, mm -hmm. you know, Microsoft who, you know, bought, I think bought them or bought AI and, you know, the people who are on that, but other people, it's like, how do you even get a piece of that? Like, how do you even, that does seem to be, I mean, in human history, resources accumulate like that, that, that seems to be always the case where it eventually becomes winner take all if there's not some sort of intervention. Well, okay. So I, I don't, yeah, that's almost I think that's almost like a sort of like communist uh, a dialectical materialism that says that happens naturally. I don't think it totally happens naturally. I think the reason why it's happening natu now is because of the regulatory hurdles that are in place. I think it's just so complicated oh. to start a business and, the, and taxes are so high. And I mean, you know, we're taxed 40, 50% in California. Mm. There's just, the, the barriers are so high, it just, to get your head out of the water and start breathing air, it's just drowning all the small players. So it's only big players that are just scooping everything up. So like, I don't know if you, I mean, like the internet used to be a collection of sites, you know, mm -hmm. it used to, and like, or Amazon is a really good example. Amazon didn't pay sales tax for a really long time. Right, right. And, and completely put how many businesses out of business to take over and, and you know, so that's another good example. You know, once these tech companies reach this critical mass, and they have the lawyers that can deal with FDA, FTC, that, you know, they have relationships, they cannot pay sales tax. Like, let's say you started a software startup for Amazon, like right now, um, there's an example when you, we do, we have subscribe and save customers. They, you know, when you go on Amazon, it says like subscribe and save. Mm -hmm. Amazon's starting to give you data on that. They didn't give you a lot of data forever. Mm -hmm. You didn't know how many customers you have. They just told you how many subscribing and save customers you have. Like they just told us at least like uh, months ago, like not very long. Like you've got X number of hundred or thousand subscribers and that's the only metric you were getting. Just soon, I didn't even have that before. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So now they're starting to, and now it's starting to give you like by product and like a okay. little more data. The data is still really raw. We're having like build spreadsheets and stuff. But if you started a software company and you were like, I'm gonna process, do an API, pull, pull that data, process it, and then put it in a usable format where you can make some data-driven decisions, that'd be a, a logical business to start. Right. Six months though, Amazon's gonna have all that. Right, right. And you're gonna lose your API access mm -hmm. and now you're out of business. So it it, it, it it does seem like some of these tech companies have reached sort of this critical mass that's sort of terrifying. Amazon still does make like well over half its revenue from independent sellers though. So they, well, it's revenue from Amazon from the retail division. Yeah, right, right, right. I'm not talking about web services and stuff. You're right. Yeah, they, they do make a lot of money in their data se right. sector and stuff. So, yeah. So the uh, regenerative health, did I get that right? Uh, yeah, regenerative medicine. Regen regenerative medicine. Yeah. Uh, so what are what are the business opportunities there for someone who's not a conglomerate? Like what would be the way to get into that? There's a few different ways and that's, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Um, there is the the place the side you want to be on is the technology side you want to be a biotech if you can obviously oh it's expensive. yeah that's expensive right of <laughs> yeah. course of course where i want to be yeah it's where we all want to be it's <laughs> freaking some publicly traded biotech company right. you know but you try i think you try to be adjacent to that without being too specific i think okay. you try to find ways you know distributor you know you try to build relationships to be sort of adjacent to the new biotechnologies that are coming up mm -hmm. or you open a clinic with a provider. Mm. And that's a sort of tried and true path. 
it's because that's also I just went to a conference for medical spas that do this kind of stuff. And that's I that feels when I was at that conference, it felt like supplements felt 10 years ago. Interesting. In what way? It just it's just immature. Like they're not, right. it's not totally polished yet. Right. Everybody's not doesn't have everything totally locked down. Things are being figured out. Hmm. People are there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of people getting into it, but it's not like it doesn't have that like ma fully mature business feeling yet. And mm -hmm. and uh yeah, it's 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 a trip. I think there's a lot of opportunity in regenerative medicine and cash medicine. I mean, telemedicine, dude, it, the most unbelievable thing that I have seen in the business space, like people just getting screwed is the COVID-19 was, you know, you had the telemedicine uh, permission because of the uh, emergency. So people could prescribe controlled medications right. for all of, so they built all these businesses mm -hmm. around that and the emergency ended May 1st. And, right. and now they can only prescribe, I don't know if they, may, this, this was, I, ch I only know this as of like 10 days ago, but it was like, you can, um, you can prescribe controlled medications for 30 days, then you need a referral from a physical face-to-face -face provider oh. to continue to offer telemedicine. So there is huge businesses that, that formed around um, this whole telemedicine thing that are gonna have to pivot. You right. know, they're not totally screwed, but they're gonna have to pivot hard yeah. and their business just got a lot more complicated. So, right. so there's an example of, I think, regulatory hurdles mm -hmm. making it harder, because there were some big players that were building in the space, some that we know, and, and they, uh, you know, now it's like, do we got to pivot? We got to find a way of dealing with it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So, so physical spas, uh, physical locations, you know, this is something that uh, a trend that I'm interested in, that there's been such a big push for pure software, right? Because that's the most scalable. It's like the lowest hanging fruit. That's all been pretty, <laughs> most of the easy problems to solve have been <laughs> solved, right? So people are now, you're into software? Huh? You like you like the software space? Yeah, yeah. I think no. Do you like <laughs> no, really? Well, I mean, I don't think that I would be the person to uh, execute okay. a software company. But if I was a venture capitalist, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, got it. So you have like a like a intellectual interest. In I, I'm I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate gotcha. the idea of okay. you know build it once, sell it twice. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, there's yeah. of course that's where the most margins are. But I think that there has been such a, a pervasive narrative about the death of retail, the death of physical spaces. Like we're all gonna be uh, shopping on Amazon and we're gonna be visiting um, uh, the metaverse. We're gonna all be in Zuckerberg's metaverse going well, there's to a e There's an ETF, there's a death of retail ETF. Really? Yeah, yeah, I think it, I forgot who offers it, but there's literally a, it's like a, you, you can buy ETF, like ex an exchange traded fund that, that is betting or tries to get exposure in the death of retail. So yeah, it's a, it's a narrative, dude. But I think that it's not, I don't think that's the whole picture. I think that we've played it out a little bit too much. I think that the retailers that have died in the last 10 years, they were just doing bad at retail. They yeah, weren't- yeah. Target's smoking. Right? Yeah, Target Target's killing it. And they went, now granted, they went big on their e-commerce. They spent a lot of money on that. They do a good job there. And they're Sorry. finally starting to leverage like local pickup and local delivery right, the way that right, works. Right. And then there's Bed Bath and Beyond that just declared bankruptcy. And oh people- God, that was such a cluster. That was such <laughs> right? a cluster, dude. I think the narrative has been, oh, Amazon eats another, another business. Yeah. But the reality is Bed Bath and Beyond, they shit the bed all on their own. Like it had nothing yeah, to do with Amazon. Was a disaster, yeah, they, it was confusing. Supply chain screwed them up. They tried to move all private label in-house. They had no inventory during uh, COVID. They the private label thing. Yeah, they did the same thing that, well, a similar thing to what um, I think it was Ron Johnson tried to do with JCPenney, where they tried to reduce couponing, build all private label, mm. and you just... It, Bed Bath Beyond was all coupons. Like, has, that was why you went yes, to Bed Bath Beyond. Yes. It was like crazy coupons. You can never, ever, ever leave coupons. Once you're on coupons, you're on there forever. So yeah. it's fine, but don't ever try to get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I think that the narrative around... Uh, software is going to eat the world has been overblown a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, that was a very long way of saying... No, I agree with you, man. The idea of a spa, the idea of a physical location that is well executed, I think it's harder to do, but that's kind of the benefit. There's two answers to the this whole, like, software eating the world thing, which I think is, like, a perfect way of putting it. Um, and I actually think... Customer experience. And, and I think, actually... 
part of customer experience is aesthetics. And I think that that, even if you look at AI, like, dude, if you watch some of these movies on Netflix now, like these second, they call them like second screen movies, like you're not even supposed to watch them. They're like throw away. You're supposed to be like on your phone. Right. It's just, gar it's just garbage. Video games. I, I had, I've recently finally had a little bit of time and I was like, okay, I'm going to play a video game. There's, n there's nothing. Like they all, it, it's, it's, I was just uh, watching a piece on, or like watching a YouTube uh, video on it on people are just like, there's no good games. All these AAA studios are just putting out trash. And it's like, I think the answer is to stop with the quantity, go for quality, and like AI can just spit out content now. We're just gonna get so much content, so much like just jumbled, messy, throwaway content. Not even messy, but just throwaway content. I think the people, I think aesthetics, the art of like, you know, beauty and making experiences that are actually like, you know, genuinely different and sublime and thoughtful is gonna be the only way to compete, to do well, it's gonna be the only thing that like, it's gonna it's gonna stand out among all that that software noise and efficiency and mm -hmm. talking to India when you call in and you know all that stuff. So I think I think you're right. I think there should be a lot more time spent on aesthetics. I'm with you. So that reminds me of uh, this thought I've had around Amazon recently. So when I was first getting into you know, e-commerce and you were giving me advice on things to do. You gave me some very good advice at the time, which was just copy Amazon. You know, they've tested everything to death. That's going to be a really good starting point. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. They're doing it like start there and try your modifications. And I think that, uh, I took that advice almost too far. I believe that Amazon has become, it feels like, uh, um, what is it? Like a, not like a dollar store, kind of like a dollar store, like a, a it's swap a budget, It's a budget option. <laughs> yes. Oh, it, we, we, that's all our reps tell us. That's all, it's all price. It's just price, 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 price. Yes. And, and, you, and if you're more expensive, it's, it, it's hard to get the volume and then you don't get the search and then it's, you know. I like the, I find myself shopping on websites other than Amazon a lot more often now because they have editorialized, they've curated their, their products. So if there's something that I want to buy that they have at REI, I'm going to buy it from REI. I'm REI, REI is actually a great example of a business that just kills it. Yes. They, they are competing in that world and they're charging way more. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I, maybe maybe you have to be a member or something. Those prices are outrageous usually. You, you but. do, and you get like, for me, it's worked out to I think about ten percent back. So when I make a purchase, you know, you okay. get because it's they all seem a little more than ten percent up over everything else. Oh, well, yeah, you're probably paying you know twenty or thirty over. But <laughs> great for them, they're killing it. And though they, from what I've seen, their relationships with their vendors are such that they they don't they don't sell products that you can easily purchase on Amazon for less. So all sorts of sellers game Amazon, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, to like. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. But for the most part, the stuff you can buy there, you can't get on Amazon right. for cheaper. So I think- and, and a lot of them, I think REI is, you usually have questions with your products, right? Mm -hmm. you need, like there's like specific, mm. it's like, ah, I'm gonna be camping in this temperature. Right. What sleeping bag do I need? So there's like a live curation that happens, that works. That That's that an excellent point, yeah. People off of Amazon. <laughs> and it's like a scene, it's like a, it's like a weird pickup scene at REI. Everybody's like, got their coolest North Face jacket on, walking in. It's like a whole Yeah, and, and for some reason, I walk around REI and I'm like, these employees have health care. I don't know why I, I know that, but I just I can just tell these employees have health care for some reason. It's the same feeling you get at Whole Foods. Right. Maybe they're just like a little more relaxed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're less manic about their impending death. Yeah, yeah about their early death. <laughs> and they're being bankrupt because of medical bills. Oh, yeah. man. That's funny. Yeah, so I really like going to Aria. I feel like a better person, like a cooler person when I'm in there. They yeah, I mean, conscious well. conscious spending too. I mean, I, I do, these all these tech companies, if you look at earnings, I mean, it, it could be the economy too, but they're, you know, they're, they're sort of hit a growth cap. Like for the first time, you know, like, I don't know if Google's had a down year, but like their, you know, their stock prices aren't just like, oh, you just buy Apple, you just buy Amazon, you right. just buy Google. Like, I think, Apple just reported and they were what, 5% down year over year or something like that. But I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I just know they're not this just like, they're getting more mature too. Mm -hmm. So I really hope there's room for a new wave. The only thing that's scary, cause that's what should happen is they should get tired and old and then there should be a new wave. And, but the problem is it's not, we, we talked about regulation. There's another thing. It's the, it's the private equity and venture cap, private equity mostly that's causing all these small companies to go, to get gobbled up. Like 
if you have an opportunity for a 50 million or 75 million dollar 100 million dollar exit why would you ever build the next procter and gamble like right. people people get to the set for life point and then they get bought out and then they're done you don't right. have an entrepreneur who's going to take it all the way from zero to a billion mm -hmm. you know there and that's also very hard to do usually not one person can do all that you know one one ceo but who would do it when you have a private equity group who's like, okay, five, okay, 10, okay, 25, okay, 50, okay, 100, okay. At some point, you're just like, okay, I'm out, I'm done. <laughs> right. And then eventually they wind up either bought, you know, strategic acquisitions by Google, flipped up to higher private equity, and then mm -hmm. they're just all owned by, you know, big money firms. So someone has to have the courage to be like, I want to build a new institution. I, I guess I can't really think of the last time there's been a really big company i'd have to look into it that like what do you mean started from scratch and is now an institution like instagram got bought google right. got bought twitch twitch got bought by amazon i right. trying to think of someone who actually is like part of our daily tech stack uh -huh. that's still independently slack. owned no slack got bought by salesforce <laughs> there you Damn go uh, yeah <laughs> right they all get gobbled up yeah yeah which so twitch was always the one i used to think of and right. it was justin.tv or whatever and nope mm -hmm. amazon now it's mm -hmm. a nightmare there seems to be this, I, I always think of a tree, stick with me for a second, it's kind of a weird metaphor, but uh, the corporation becomes like the roots and maybe the trunk, <clears throat> excuse me. So the corporation is like the roots of the trunk and then the branches are the actual operating entities. So that's, if you're Salesforce, that's your whatever, this is our Salesforce CRM, this is Slack, this is whatever, those are yeah. the branches. But the point of the roots is to soak up the nutrients. So it's basically the interface with the stock market, right? This is the, the interface with the stock market, that's the roots. Yeah. And if you're building an operating company, if you're building a company whose function is to, you know, uh, code software effectively, then you don't really have any business being the roots. You should be a branch. Does that yeah. metaphor yeah, track yeah. at all? Yeah, yeah, so what you're saying is that the, uh, the core function of these, yeah, I think so, the core function of these businesses as they get to a certain size is no longer serving the consumer. It's basically their product is their shares, it's their share price. I think that for the holding company, so if it's well built, you would assume that the holding company is- What's happened in video games. It's exactly what's happened in video games. How so? They're just, they suck. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they suck, they, but they still earn. Right. EA, Electronic Arts, still right. earns. They just released this new Jedi game, like this new Star Wars game that was supposed to be this open world, amazing experience. People were so excited about it. And it's just a mess. Like it literally mm -hmm. doesn't function, like frame rate drops, like mm -hmm. all kinds of issues. And, but I mean, or Blizzard, I'm sorry, way better example is Activision Blizzard, mm -hmm. um, who Microsoft is acquiring right now. Are they? They're, they've been trying to for a while. Oh. They're like going through approval. Okay. I don't know if it's got approved yet or not. I think it is going to go through. But they were a small company. Their purpose was making video games that people loved. They did. They were great at it. And then all of a sudden, they got to a certain size, and now it's just going to be like they're folded into Microsoft's wing. Right. They're already a publicly traded company, but right. it started to be about their share price. They totally lost their mission-critical focus. Right. And, yeah, so... It's yeah. It's it, it once something is a public entity or gets beyond a certain size, it it, it it just starts to suck. That's where you hope new companies come in, right? Yes. And really, the only good games that are coming out are from smaller developers now. So that's. I have thought. I have so. Uh, this is not a fully formed thought. This is just like very raw, whatever uh, shower thoughts I've had. I love REI so much because somehow they have been able to maintain their focus and they're the same. What's interesting about them, and I've not done a deep enough dive on this yet, is they're technically a co-op. So yeah. uh, to my understanding- you get money back, right? You get like a check every You get a check, it's your dividend. It's like 10 bucks. Which is the amount of money you overspent on your stuff that year. Oh, is that what it is? Okay, okay. <laughs> That's your, your dividend. But uh, I've always been like a stark capitalist, but I do think that, uh, Scale is so crucial that we all end up with these massive corporations whose customer becomes the shareholder. And there are very few companies that have been able to maintain, like you're saying, that pure product focus, that pure execution mm -hmm. focus. And I'm very interested in what types of structures uh, facilitate that. What's the incentive structure to well, make that happen? Get, yeah, I think you gotta, I think the one thing that we're not talking about, which really like, could send us like down a hole is it's access to capital. 
Right. It's it's the it's the Federal Reserve at mm -hmm. some level. It's it's these big banks. It's Goldman. It's mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan. It's you know they're at the top, and the, you know there's money, but it's it's that commercial money, or that's mm -hmm. it's that money that they have access to that they can finance these massive deals. Mm -hmm. So I think if you had, for example, is not what we're ever going to have, and it probably would have problems. But let's say a gold standard. Or hard money, some type of hard money where you where money was every money was a hard money loan essentially. Right. You didn't have all this like soft window lending and right. stuff. I don't think you'd have the uh, roll ups that we see everywhere. Uh. But but you know when you could just pull on like funny money, you mm -hmm. know, and it's not always like that. But when you can pull on funny money, it it becomes very easy to just keep buying shit. Because this is I mean? the game with the per, a lot of these acquisitions, they. Uh, make an acquisition of something that will bump their stock price, right? So if you can buy a company- It's it, done. If, you're a ca if your market yeah. cap is 100 billion and you overpay for a little startup, you spend a billion dollars on a startup that's probably only worth 100 million or something if you were to actually do like a, a you know PE multiple. Yeah. But- You get a public market multiple now. Yes, now you're getting a public market multiple where they say, oh my gosh, uh, Microsoft is now into the AI game and then their billion dollar acquisition just bumped their stock price by $10 billion. It's free money. It's free money. And 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 you, if you need an underwriter to mm -hmm. underwrite that deal, who wouldn't? They <laughs> right. can do the math. Okay, it's times five here, it's times 25 there. <laughs> right. You know, the, the the price to earnings ratio on what on this company is 25, the, P, the private equity multiple is five, we're gonna right. buy that. Okay, we'll underwrite it, and we'll underwrite it with somebody else's money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, I, 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 I don't think, I don't think it's a failure of capitalism. I, I don't think what we have is true, like Austrian economic hard money capitalism. <laughs> right. I think we have like a really silly sort of mixed socialist is or almost uh, uh, almost sort of fascistic syndicalist syndicalistic system where you have these like certain people have more access to money and mm -hmm. you know industries start to really become these big conglomerates and cartels. And that's that's kind of what's happening. It's like a cartelization. But I think if you had hard money, real competition, low regulation, you're gonna get innovation because old companies, it's just, they get slow and dumb and out of touch. And you have young people come up and they come up with new ideas. Are there any companies that you admire right now that are doing a good job? Mm, that's a super good question. I, I uh, who does a good job? In any industry. Yeah, no, I know, I'm trying to think. RH. Who? RH, Restoration Hardware. Oh, yeah, they're killing it. Yeah. Restoration Hardware did it on, that's actually, a, they're they're public now, and I think they're, I mean, they're owned by themselves, they're public, and they did a phenomenal job. They're really, they're doing these new, like, experience things, I mm -hmm. think, where you, like, you go there, and it's like a wine, and like champagne and you have like a dinner event and people buy like, you know, $30,000 in furniture on average, you know, for their best customers. I think they're well-managed, headed to the top company. I think they're gonna absolutely destroy it. And look, they're they're higher market. They're selling to winners, you know, the the winners in the economy. Right. It'll be That'd interesting. That'd be my example. Do you have an example? Uh, REI, I love REI. R R so REI, yeah, that and makes sense. Apple, I think Apple has done, there, there are many, many criticisms that are yeah. fair to levy at Apple, but, uh, in general, I think that they have historically done better than most at maintaining a product focus. Like, yeah, yeah, they ha they haven't they haven't gone like Google where they're doing you know they're at Google's an advertising company, but they're you know self driving cars and they keep buying stuff and you know they're all over the place. It's like they're pretty. Apple has sort of kind of stayed stayed on track. They have maintained. What I love about Apple is that now uh, there are plenty of examples where this isn't the case, but in general, they have maintained. Uh, they will do things slowly and do them right. So like yeah. HomeKit, uh, Apple HomeKit is yeah, yeah. really far behind everybody else as far as integrations. Like if you do, if you let Alexa run your home, there's way more functionality there than there is with HomeKit. But HomeKit is far more reliable, far more stable in most instances. Uh, yeah, My Google Nest is trash. It's horrible. I hate it. And yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 you're, I think you're totally right. I think you're totally right. They do things slow. They like they haven't jumped into the advertising space yet, even though they did take everybody's data back, which I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because they're going to get into advertising oh. one way or another. Um, that track started to cut you off, but that tracks yeah. Tim Cook's goal to make them into a services company. There you go. Mm, well, yeah, but there's only so no, no. There's only so much innovation left in the hardware space, right? You know, so it's like, and how big can you make an iPad? <laughs> you know, or small, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. so I, I think that 
but they but they do kind of do things slow and do them well. I was thinking of RH as a as a newer company. I, th- I mean, they're, I think they're a bit newer on the scene than Apple. Did we say restoration hardware? If anybody's listening, it's, we're talking about restoration hardware. Yeah, restoration hardware. RH is yeah. I, I mean, they're over. They're probably overpriced, right? And you can if you go to like estate sales and you shop around. I mean, it's not true. Like, I was looking. I was trying to figure. I don't know, but I know there's a difference between like real furniture and like almost like faux furniture and right like if uh, what like american river company i think and like uh eames like the eames chair uh, right. uh herman miller yeah like they make like real furniture and then everybody else is kind of selling like so it's like do you want to spend fifteen thousand dollars on a chair or twenty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars on a chair or do you want to spend five thousand and feel like you spent twenty thousand right but it's weird that there's like a distinction between like the real made in america like handcrafted Amish sometimes furniture. Right, and heirloom like, quality. Yeah, heirloom know. quality. That's the, that's the word yeah. I'm looking for, or the phrase I'm looking for. Yeah, because yeah. there's like Ikea. So on the continuum, there's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Ikea. And then honestly, not really higher in quality, but much higher in price is like all of the like CB2, West Elm. And well, there's, I think there's living spaces somewhere before West Elm, right? Or would you put them on the same level? In my limited experience buying stuff from living spaces, it's I've had I've experienced the same quality from like as IKEA. West no no as West oh, Elm so Living Spaces yeah. is like gotcha uh, they seem to be similar to West yeah. Elm and CB two I think that yeah, West Elm yeah. and CB two to your point about the importance of design and customer experience it's they're all uh, I'm oversimplifying and I don't know much of what I'm talking about here but they're all using the same like ten factories to build yeah, their stuff yeah, right yeah, yeah. It's, it's what it feels like at least yes and not everybody I mean it feels like yeah um, all of the like. Uh, uh, CB2, West Elm, no, it doesn't, Apple, it, does, it doesn't feel like a, a huge jump up in build quality. They all have similarly, like they're all engineered wood frames on the couches. Yeah, they're they're all particle board where you can't see. Yes. But like where you can see, you know, they do a little bit better, but nothing's like, it's like, nothing's like hand screwed or all of it is thin wood veneer. Yeah. yeah you don't it, get yeah. bolts. Yeah. You don't <laughs> right. get bolts. You get nails or screws. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I bought an Eames chair. I bought a proper Eames chair. It's it it absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. And yeah. I looked at what goes into making those, how they fold the walnut. Yeah, the plywood, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they take a walnut piece and they fold, They get it wet and they fold it and then they put another one and they fold it. Yeah. You're like, yeah, that's gonna cost a lot. I mean, there's, I bought mine for like in the, in the high fours, low fives. Mm-hmm. They're like bottom, like the cheapest you can get them for, I think now is like seven. Wow. So it's like, well, that's inflation. But, but so and not everyone has access to that. Like I, that was a, that was a splurge for me anyway. Right. It was expensive. I always wanted one, but but you're right. You got West Elm, and then you're probably going to say, what's next? So, yeah, so I'd say, like, Ikea, then, like, then Living Spaces, then maybe slightly above that, CB2 West Elm. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I think the next jump is RH. Uh, I think you're right. Then I think Heirloom it's, quality. It's, like, heirloom quality, truly handmade. And this the furniture that... That doesn't have prices. You know, you go on the website and they say, these are the sofas that you can order in any length, any style, any fabric. Yeah. Call. Yeah. <laughs> Give us a call. I almost got a, shit, I forgot what kind of a couch it was, but I I think it's, the, yeah, it was a, it's a certain kind of couch. I think it's where it has like the button, where it's like buttoned in, the leather's like buttoned in, so it has like a texture to it. Anyway, it's a certain name of a couch. I I, I was going to get a custom and they yeah. all they do custom and they, and you'll, they'll sometimes they'll have a piece because someone like backed out of a deal. Right. And it's like, you'll have like prices for like one or two pieces right. to get a feel. Yeah, that's the kind of furniture you want in your house if you can. Right. But you have to know where you're going to live. That's why it's, I think it's for rich people because like really rich people because you're like, they have their property they're not going to move. They're going to own it for a few generations. It's in a trust. Right. They can buy a you know thirty five thousand dollar couch because they're not you know they're not going to buy right. and sell and flip and move and right. you know or they have so much that they don't care. Thirty five thousand dollar couch is the same as IKEA. Right. Or <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think there is there is something about having to switch properties all the time, which is mm-hmm. I think the lesser classes have to right, have to right. do is like we're always moving up and selling houses. You know, I actually had my house uh, looked at yesterday to get a price on it um i guess right now it's so bizarre but prices are way up in my area still seems like it's running on fumes is what he's saying Uh to me i mean it's sort of a sales tactic but i think he's also right um just the inventory is so low Uh, that's the only reason that it's still up because the interest rates are so horrible right now it can't stay like this no no but there's just no houses and there's still people some Bitcoin cash, some tech money cash. Uh, yeah, you know, there's still people who have, who are just gonna buy in cash. Uh-huh. And yeah, but I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah, my brother's been sending me all the AI. Uh, they have AI uh, like rappers now. People are like singing and like turning you into Drake or whatever. And oh. it's like really good, like surprisingly good. Like we're getting, I think we're getting really close to where there's just going to be an AI rapper. They're, that's not even a person to begin with. It's just I think they it. have some, I and mean, they're not necessarily popular, but I've, I read something about this, like some K-pop person who's yeah. just AI. Yeah, yeah. Figured that was coming. Wow. I didn't know that was coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, and I, I wonder if it, the one thing I'm wondering is when is it going to write its own? Does it write its own lyrics too? Uh, it wouldn't be hard for it to. No. So in podcast stuff, as I've been researching different mm -hmm. softwares and whatever, they have software now for podcasting that will do. Um, uh, you can train it on your own voice, and then do text to speech of your own voice, and it will insert it for you. So, for example, if I might try doing it with the dog whining right now. I can have it recreate what I'm saying oh, that's crazy. in an AI voice without the dog whining, obviously, and it'll insert it perfectly. If you need to redo a part. I, you know what I thought you were gonna say at first, that's me, I thought you were gonna say it'll find the dead spots and edit it and cut them down. It'll do that too. That's and it'll cool. remove filler words like um and ah uh and all that too. That's good. Yeah, I've, I remember, have you ever been, have you ever like done any speech training where they train you on like not using filler words? No, have you done training on it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, just from speech and debate, where you have someone who sits there and like every time you go, what they used to do is every time I would say um, I think I think mine was no, mine was um, I think, and they would go um. <laughs> <laughs> they do it on Community. The yeah, they, show. They, right. It's but that's a real thing, and, right. he, and someone does that while you're speaking in front of people. Right. You, it like it helps. You Interesting. Know. Like you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're just like okay, uh, you, yeah. So anyway, when, okay. So I might have to cut this because I don't want to say the word get into conspiracy stuff but like <laughs> please let's do somebody asked a good question on a podcast why is there fentanyl in cocaine right now because it doesn't make a lot of sense that anybody would add fentanyl to their cocaine it's a downer with an upper there's no incentive for any dealer at anywhere in the supply chain yeah to potentially to step on it with fentanyl yeah. yes so why is there so much fentanyl and coke and it's okay let's go one level trip not trippier but let's go one level removed from that or historical maybe a couple levels but do you know about the opium wars that, no okay so there's we or not we but the british fought a war in china to continue selling dope oh. opium to the chinese the chinese blocked it at their ports and then the british said no you must buy it and i'm way oversimplifying, but you must buy it. And then they fought a war and then they kept selling them dope. But they understood, and I think there's some writings, they understood what they were doing to the population by mm. by pumping dope and they were making it more mm. docile because they were, a, you know, they were basically a, not a property, but a, a colony of of England, you know? Mm. And you still had Shanghai up until very, or not Shanghai, uh, Hong, Hong Kong, Kong until very recently, right? 97, I think, yeah. Yeah, and, and it still kind of has the two systems that are like almost done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the British got out in 97. Um, Chinese have done the exact, they learned that and they did the exact, they're doing the exact same thing in the United States. It seems like it. it most it fentanyl from. is yeah, produced there, right? It's either produced there and I think now the Chinese have set up labs in Mexico because it's closer. Interesting. That's the newest thing that I've heard at least is that they're they're setting up those labs in Mexico because they know how to produce it and then it, they, but the, the, the Mexicans and the cartels know how to ship it. They're the distribution. They are the supply chain for the world to get drugs into the US, right? Yeah, yeah. They have the, what's the, what's it called? The, uh, um, they're the name of the, the plazas. I think they're called, I think they're, I'm, I could be misquoting this, but they're, the plazas are the different drug channels in the United States and who has control over those, the border crossings, the big border crossings mm -hmm. is like this cartel owns this crossing, this cartel owns this crossing, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. These ones specialize in planes, these ones specialize in tunnels, these ones. But it's, it's really, it's like almost like highways into the United States right. and they fight over those right. in battle. And right. it's, it's like, I think it's called the plaza system. The plaza system might be something different, but it, yeah, it's no, that's, that's what they're good at. So the Chinese have now, I think it's pretty well known that they've hooked up with them to yeah. do their shipping. Get their stuff into here. I guess. <laughs> If I was a rival nation, I would certainly yeah, yeah. see the benefit of poisoning, <laughs> you know, yeah. a generation. 300,000 dead a year. How much How much money spent on treatment? And yeah, I know. It's wild, dude. It's it's not a, it's definitely not good for the United States. It's not strategically, it's not a good mm -hmm. thing. And I don't know if you really have a, that's why the drug war question is so, it's such a, like a tricky, super, super, super tricky question because 
I do think like they've had outcomes where they've legalized drugs or decriminalized drugs and it's had good health outcomes. But like if you could really go get heroin at Target, I don't I don't know. I don't, I don't know think that's, that's good. I'm yeah, or you. cocaine at Target. I don't I don't know if that's a good idea for a nation. I think it should be illegal. That, that, there there has to be a line somewhere, I think. Yeah. You're right. If you could get heroin at Target, a lot of people would do heroin. A lot more people than now. If you could brand it and like <laughs> let me market it, you know, it'd be the easiest thing in the world to sell. So, but but you take the crime out of it, you take the price down, mm-hmm. you take the you destigmatize it for people mm-hmm. getting help. I mean, it's got all these different benefits, mm-hmm. but strategically, it's one of those things. I think there's got to be like something as addictive and destructive as that. Like it, we've seen people, we've lost people in our lives that have gone down that road and it's it's not the same as cigarettes no. or or beer or whatever. It's no, And you could you can mess yourself up pretty good on alcohol. I mean it's it's physically addictive too. It's barbiturate and everything, but <laughs> alcohol by the way probably we're never going to go there. It's ne- we're never going to be able to get it done, like to make it illegal. But it probably should be illegal. It's pretty bad for us. Yeah. Like. Oh my God. I, I always, whenever you talk to a cop and he's just like, a, like a like a beat cop, he's just like every like ninety nine percent of the violent scenes or crimes or assaults that I go to, domestic abuse. There's always there was there's always booze. It's always mm-hmm. booze involved. But where's the line then? If you because I know you've fancied yourself to be somewhat of a libertarian. I know, I know, I, I, I'm guilty of that for sure. But it doesn't, to go, and by the way, for anybody still listening to us, we are way far afield of what our specialties are. You should probably stop listening. <laughs> but <Yeah. we're, laughs> the idea of pure laissez-faire capitalism. Well, no, I it, actually, if you could tune in, because I know libertarian stuff pretty fucking well, actually. Uh, true, okay, okay. <laughs> we're, we actually might be getting back afield. It's talking about furniture, I don't know what I'm talking about, but... <laughs> But uh, skip my parts then. Just listen yeah, to Kyle. No, no, no. Pure laissez-faire capitalism. It's a good question. Is very appealing from a moral standpoint. Meaning, you know, eat, eat what it's you clean. kill. Yeah. Do you are able to uh, say? Did you provide value? Okay, you get food. <laughs> did you not provide value? You don't get food. It's very pure in that way. And there's less. And there's less third parties who are being like, okay, I got to get sixty percent of your food or forty percent of your food taken out. And oh, was that? You know, there's just there's less waste in the system too. So the idea is there's more food to go around. But it doesn't you, you're work. not prevented from hunting on my grounds, like, or not mm-hmm. prevented from hunting on my grounds. But you you can go out and create your you know hunt in your own space. There's free space. Yeah, sorry, keep going. So why doesn't it work? It's because it doesn't work. Yeah, it does. I think ultimately it doesn't work. So. When it worked, when did it work? Well, it worked in the United States. I mean, it built the United States in a lot of ways. I, I mean, I don't think we were pure lazy fair, but we were about the most libertarian country. Okay. Yeah, I mean, de facto libertarian. Or no, I'm sorry, there's de facto, and then there's like in, by law. Right. And I think we were probably by law one of the most libertarian countries. You have places that are just like fucking wild and crazy, and the governments are ineffective, so they're libertarian. But yeah, there's a lot of libertarian governments in Africa. Mexico <laughs> feels more libertarian just because the government is just incompetent, <laughs> right? right? Yes. Yeah, but but we were actually like, in fact, we were in fact and by law libertarian, and I think it worked because um, we had the West. We had this big open space, mm-hmm. we had land grants, you could just go West. And that, that's been a theory. I think that's called the Turner thesis, the frontier thesis, is that we had this like endless space that you mm-hmm. could just always go and just start a farm, start a homestead, mm-hmm. build a new, create. And it created like a release valve for these oh. cities. And it created an opportunity, an endless opportunity for people to feed themselves and to make it in the world. Okay. And once the West was closed mm-hmm. and you know you had all that, all that space and all, and it's it, it's fu- it's messed up because it's not actually closed. There's tons of space. It's just owned by the federal government now, or mm-hmm. owned by. There's these huge parcels that are owned by governments and regulated, and it's you know like total like uh, eco stuff where you can't build on land and you can't use land. Even you if you own water rights, land, it, yeah, you don't have water rights. Like, but before you could just go and use and eat what you kill. It worked, and I so it's it's very easy I think to blame libertarianism. It's very natural to blame libertarianism for the problems of regulation. 
um, the problems that regulation caused because there's always another actor who perverted things. There's always the Federal Reserve that you could kind of be like, okay, well, how much does that pervert markets? Mm -hmm. How much is that perverting the system? Mm -hmm. How much is regulation perverting the system, et cetera? That being said, you, yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't fully work, I don't think, because human beings are stupid. And Too short term. We can only think to our next meal. Yeah, and, and and a lot of human beings are stupider than others. Like, I mean, <laughs> just know? frankly, like, there's just the, people do need to be ruled. They've always needed to be ruled by a ruler. It, I just think we happen to have the worst possible combination and form of government now. Like, we have like really? the worst of all worlds. Yeah, I mean, when you hear about when when you read about the original Athenian dem democracy, like, what's required in a democracy is like an intelligent politically engaged small population mm. who's very active and there's a very rich political life like people hate being political right democracy is politics like right. you that's you have to be and it has to be engaged and it's, it kind of has to be a small nation why too. do you have to be small uh, because I because I think that there's so many varied needs. That's why we're a republic. But there's so many varied needs in a nation, and there's so many different space. Like, if you have a city state like Athens, it's kind of easy for everyone to get on the same page. Like, mm -hmm. oh hey, you know, Spartans are invading, or 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 the Persians are invading. You mm -hmm. know, let's get around. Let's let's do a tax to pay for this. But once you get like a huge empire like the United States and a huge space like the United States, you know, Florida needs something different than. So we kind of have a good system in being a republic. We're going towards just being kind of a mass democracy. Mm. And you need a population that's like super smart, super engaged, super willing to be political, super knowledgeable on issues, has access, free access to the mechanisms of government, like not um, like not incumbency advantage. You don't have senators who've been there for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Right. Like you need a fast turnover. And it's still a mess. Mm -hmm. Democracy is even in that case, usually still an uncertain decision because people are fickle. They change their mind. They want one thing, one, and they change. And they, it's hard to like think big, think long term. The only person who can do that usually is a monarch, right? And that's why monarchies are usually stable and effective. And like, if you think for a while, well, until democracy comes in, you right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, if you think of probably like the most. You know, what are the greatest empires the world has ever seen? They're all monarchies. Like mm. the British Empire, the the Roman Empire was, you know, it was a sort of a, it, was a, it became a republic, but it was a, basically a monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those are the two, those are the two biggest ones I can think of. There's the Carthaginian Empire. I guess there's like, you know, China sort of, I mean, the Persians had an empire, but the, the two big ones I think of are, in the modern times at least, are Britain and Rome and... Yeah, that's just not, you don't have people being like, oh, what should we do? Should we? And then as soon as democracy came into Britain, became more dem democratic, the empire fell. Mm. Just, it's gone. They lost all their holding. Fall of Rome is, I wish I knew it. I really wish I knew it better. I, I, I know, I know generally what happened. I don't, there's a, there's, I think this guy named Gibbon, William Gibbon wrote the, like the most famous, I need to read that, most famous, like, it's like a 12 volume on the fall of Rome and like mm. how it happened. 12 volumes? <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, well. it was good. It's like all like, re if you're really into that stuff, it's like really, really good history. But basically they, there's a lot of things that they said caused it. Clipping coins, so what we're doing, printing money. Right. Um, Dude, and then they let the, they let the barbarians in the gates. Oh. Like they, they, they started to diversify Rome and then they were sort of unable to keep it together and then it fell and then you got the Dark Ages. That's uh, my very high level understanding. I right. Know. Well, let me know if you, I, I can't do 12 volumes, but let me know if you. <laughs> go yeah, I'm gonna go try to get him to stop. Yeah, go ahead. He's going to be sleazy. I think the most interesting part of our talk, that furniture talk. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, seriously, it's the, I found out about that because we went to a state sale and we I got a couple uh, China, real flatware, or that's not flatware, whatever, real like cups and bowls and plates yeah. that are um, like made in the UK in like 1910 or whatever. And uh, I looked at how much they cost to buy new. Yeah. It was like, they're like four or $5,000. And I'm like, I would never buy, I would never, or $3,000. I was like, I'd never pay that much for, for a cup. Like who eats off that? Like wow. buying real, like heirloom quality stuff. Like right. Like I said, it's a trip. I've started now, so first buying stuff for the house i bought stuff cheap because i'm like i have to furnish this entire house right 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 but now i just want to fill it kind of yeah just get stuff i mean 
you know, you need enough tables and couches and chairs in every room or whatever. But yeah, now I have the luxury of being like, okay, now that I'm replacing this piece of furniture, maybe I can get something nicer. And I'm replacing this. Like you can slowly get yeah. stuff that's going to last. Yeah, no, that's exactly what we did. I had to battle for, uh, a, I don't know. Well, my wife, uh, has, has, appointed our house i would say beautifully like and she, we re remodeled it you remodeled in here it looks awesome um but uh i wanted a recliner mm. <laughs> it's, it's a battle <laughs> it's a battle she was trying they try it's i think it's a woman thing but maybe uh, yeah it's a woman thing they they don't they put form before function and men put function before form right and i'm like okay let's set this room up in a way that we use it right not in a way that we are going to film an episode of Real Housewives. Right. And she just wanted it. She just like was like a recliner is for like an old people house. <laughs> and like, let's do a day bed in our living room. I'm like, we're not going to lay on a day bed to watch TV. You ever sat in a day bed <laughs> and for, tried to get out of it? For five seconds? Yeah. <laughs> Your back is shot. <laughs> yeah, I know. So anyway, I we went to a company called Our House. Oh, yeah. They're like a similar, they're like an RH kind of. They're kind of that. Similar. Yeah, yeah. And I got a. I got a nice looking, it's big enough to almost look like a love seat, which mm -hmm. is why I think I got away with it, but it's motion. Oh. So you hit a button. Have you ever been to like the nice movie theaters where they have- Yeah, like, you push a button and it kind of goes. Exactly like that. <laughs> Dude, I think the move is to go super campy with it, like to get a recliner and get like obnoxious. You, well, you, you have like mid-century modern tastes, right? To some extent, for sure, yeah. I do too. She doesn't. Oh. I I like the Eames chair is mid century modern. I think mid century modern, like speaking of eras, like that was a really dope era in furniture, really dope era in design. Lots of mm -hmm. people are still making it. It's it's but she just that's not her taste is mid century modern. So we always battle. I would have done mid century modern throughout the whole house, right? Like, kind of kitschy, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you know, a little it's a little like still a little eclectic, but there's some other vibe that they go for. I don't even know what you call what you would call it. It's just like expensive. <laughs> <laughs> just it's like a newport coast credit card debt <laughs> yeah, <cheek. laughs> yeah hard money loan like second mortgage kind of look third mortgage kind of look like, oh man yeah dude but we we had someone walk through our house yesterday and they they're like uh they sell in Kodo a lot um and you had a realtor walk through realtor yeah and she was like well first off you guys overdid your comps like you guys totally blew those <laughs> out of the water but i think right now on your oven alone yeah oh, jesus that oven that special i have a i forgot the name of the company but a special french oven it's made in a measurement that i think i told you that doesn't match normal ovens <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. so if i moved to a new house i would have to cut I would have to do a new kitchen, right. bring it with me. So that oven is comes with the house, basically. Right, right. So yeah, it was stupid. But she said she could. Pro I could probably get my more than my money out of it. But it would be like I'd have to sell at the right time. Like it'd have to be like, like right now or like during a good time. Well, like, she would say that could do it. Yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> right. But she was showing me similar sales where people had done that, kind of mm -hmm. overshot their comps a little bit because I think. Yeah, Zillow says one thing, and I think she thinks we could do like two or three thousand above, two or three hundred thousand above Zillow. Which mm -hmm. But where do you live? Right, you're talking about selling. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, 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 me. I don't know. No, no. I mean, that, that's the question I asked myself. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Asking you, like, but where do you live if you sell? Right, now? right, right. Yeah. Once you're in California and you have a place, you're kind of like, you gotta be pretty, pretty uh, reluctant to give it up. I feel like there's no, there's no real like you can't. This is true anywhere. You can't time the market unless you're going to keep the place and rent it when you buy another one. You can't, like, if, if the market's up, door. you're going to overpay on the house you're buying. If right. the market's down, you're going to lose on the house you're selling. There's no way. Well, people, what people try to do is they they do the, I've seen my parents did, they do the sell and then the rent for a while thing. I've never seen that work out. Uh, right, right. Because the market just seems to keep going up. I mean, I, I definitely know that there's, like, real estate I don't understand at all. You understand it so much better than I do. I don't. Not that well. A little I, bit. Yeah, but you kind of have a feel for it. I know commercial is like getting hammered right now, right? It's like. Dude, so this is interesting. So yeah, commercial is getting really, really hammered because of the office sector. People kept saying office is going to come back. People are going to come back. Yeah. COVID is fully done. I mean, it was what? May 1st. May 1st, it was declared yeah. officially. And the fact is nobody's going back to the office. Like we obviously, everybody yeah. learned you can work from home. I personally think that there is value in being in person me too for a lot of the stuff oh yeah but i think people are, learning, are starting to actually learn that too that that a lot of stuff 
just just a complete disaster working from home. I think that people are saying that's part of why video games suck so bad because you have a bunch of designers working from home and they're not working together. <laughs> right, right. Like, there's no creative interaction. Anyway, Interesting. Sorry, well, people were saying that the, um, uh, uh, remind me, we got to get back to offices. Commercial, yeah. Yeah, but uh, on the work from home thing, there were all of these reports that came out in the first, you know, six or 12 months of COVID saying, hey, everybody is more productive working from home than they were beforehand. Yeah, but I think the thing that that data missed is that uh, people had the benefit of their relationships and their cohesion and their culture that had been established before COVID. So they were mm. coasting off of uh, that culture that they built. It's called something. Yeah. Okay. I'd love yeah, to know what that term yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. That's called something. That's cool. Yeah. And then now they're like spending people, their inheritance basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 And now that new people are coming in that were not part of that culture to begin with, it's Chaos. not going as well as it was. You know, having a business, I can totally see that. Luckily, I've we've kept our team, but and you guys adding, are still in office. Well, most we weren't okay. And then we have a couple people who are in office. We're bringing people, like we're having people come in office. It's not every day, but we have meetings in office, and it's good. It helps, but it's because we had a team that was all in office at one point. I think right. it's the only thing holding everybody that holds everybody together. And we have a really good team now. It's incredible to see how good people have gotten over the years from where they started to nine years later. Mm -hmm. You know, some people have been with us, I think that long and they're completely like, they're like not very good. And now they're very, very good. So it's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I, I could see, I, I rented an office, um, in the last year before uh, I think commercial collapse. So I probably got a <laughs> shitty deal because I did shitty rent. But I, yeah, I heard that's what he said too. He's like, commercial is going to drop by like 40 or 50% is what people are expecting. Remember, I, remember uh, I asked you, we work. <laughs> you know what's funny? What they, a boondoggle that was. They could have pulled it off. They could have. They like, should have bought. They dude, should have bought locations instead of leasing them. So, but I mean, the we work if they hadn't that's imploded really right before COVID. Right. They, and Adam Newman has said this recently, he's like, man, if he had been at the helm when COVID happened, he could have made that work for them. And I think that's true. I think that- Who's Adam Newman? Uh, he was the CEO of WeWork, the guy who got- Oh, the crazy guy. He was flying on planes and stuff. I didn't know his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just knew the story. I didn't know the- If he name. had, oh, which by the way, uh, uh, We Crashed, the TV show on Apple Plus- Is it good? Is amazing. Is it it's good? Um, Jared Leto and Anne Hathaway. And oh. they're, it's so it freaking good. Uh, it's all about their their rise and fall. But if he had been able to hold on a little bit longer, like yeah. WeWork could have really positioned themselves well yeah. as like, hey, yeah, let us be space. your flexible office. Yeah, 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 totally. Get rid of your lease. They were trying to pitch this before, but nobody really bought it. Yeah, they, they were early. They, they, they were early. They were early. Yeah. yeah. I guess they didn't pr predict a global pandemic at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, thought, I thought their air was always not buying. I, that was my understanding. I could be totally wrong, but I thought it was like they were doing these weird leases and it's like it, yeah. they probably could have afforded if they would have done it right and grew a little sl slower to buy buildings and then they would have had hard assets that could have got them through a tough time. But they were like leasing and then subleasing, which was like- no Those smart. are, commercial real estate is very, very divorced. So uh, capital markets don't like people to own real estate. So unless you're so big that you can get away with it, that- uh, most, what if you're a real estate company, though? So that's the, so there are real estate companies, but yeah, they don't Is like that what seeing work would be. <laughs> they were effectively so that this has been the criticism of WeWork from day one is that they're effectively a a subleasing agent. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, like a pretzels company. Like they just put bags of pretzels in <laughs> <Right>. water bottles, <laughs> right? And they were trying to um, position themselves as a tech company before it fell apart. They made a bunch of acquisitions, and they. I think they were calling it Office OS, and they were trying to build. Oh Jesus! Right. Oh Jesus! They wanted the multiple of a tech company. Yeah. But they were a subleasing agent. So, but that's stupid. It's interesting now that people aren't coming back to the office, and we have you know hundreds of millions of square feet of real estate in prime locations that's not going to be able to be used. What do we do with it? The tricky thing is that it's not as easy as you'd think to repurpose these office buildings. From a zoning perspective or from like a... I think that cities will come around on the zoning side, but uh, more from the, the offices built in the 20th century didn't really care about natural light, 
So you have yeah, we windows have here, but then you've got, you know, you'd have to have a 10,000 square foot apartment to make it back to the center of yeah. the, the building where the elevators are. So what do you do with all that space? Because there's too much darkness. There aren't enough windows to Yeah, no, we, every office I've been in has just been like a cave. Yes. Like, that we rent has always been like a cave. Yeah, and who wants to live in that? You can't. No, no, yeah, you, you I gotta tear it down. <laughs> but you can't. It, it would be so unbelievably wasteful and expensive to tear it down yeah. that this is the big question. What do how you do, do you with use it? The bricks, yeah, how do you use the bricks and sticks, basically? Yes. And, That's interesting. And people want amenities, and you can't... It's really hard to build amenities. They're not plumbed right either. Yeah, exactly. They're not plumbed right. It's a fortune to build, you know, uh, shower drains and all that. Like, that costs so much money to do that on a 400,000-square-foot building. How do you do that? Can you just demo it all? Just I, give it to think, builders? I think, yeah, you just give it to the homeless population. Right? Yeah, yeah, you just let them <laughs> squat, basically. Well, yeah, like in Newport Beach, they were looking for a place to build a shelter, right? Because they had that new regulation. They couldn't they couldn't take homeless people from inside Newport Beach and drive them outside Newport Beach <laughs> right, and drop them off. Right. No, this spot, though, in Orange County is, I think, the end point. It's, it's south. What do you mean? In terms of, like, investable, make money, growth, I don't, I think Newport is matured as a matured market. There's still opportunity, I guess, if you have a shitload of money to invest, but I think the margins are, or the appreciation is not quite as good as it used to be. Laguna is Laguna. It's hard to get to. It's built out. Every square foot is built out. Mm -hmm. All the teardowns have been done in Newport. Huntington Beach is, has its own thing going on, but I think you go south, Dana Point, San Juan Capistrano, San Clemente, mm -hmm. but especially Dana Point, I think that's, it's already happening, but I think that's where you could make a ton of money. Like mm. if you bought, like a million one, something like that, and just put sweat into it, and you can make a $3 million house. Like, I think that's still mm. possible in Dana Point, whereas mm -hmm. I think the rest of Orange County, it's it's more mature, the beach cities. This is what I uh, am scared about in real estate, though. Like you said, it's, you can't time the market. Like, And that's what I've realized that the vast majority of real estate organizations uh, whether they're home builders or I mean any sort of real estate organization, any development agency, they are, uh, they're all playing the market. The people who got rich, the people who made their billions in Orange County real estate, they just happened to uh, own land in Orange County when World War II ended. It's really, yeah, it's really bizarre that Orange County is a place that was built by its own real estate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like the revenue from its own, from flipping its own real estate in for, just from people moving right. in and selling and, and like, uh, like hard money lenders, mortgage companies, mm -hmm. um, uh, title insurance. Like that's sort of what built Orange County is selling Orange County right? to other people. Totally. <laughs> I mean, the, the, so the formula to get rich is to own a lima bean farm and then build <laughs> South Coast Plaza. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> Have an orange grove where the block is now, right. you know, I mean, if you're in North Orange County. But right. Yeah, no, I mean, my house that, or the, not my house, but the house that I rented in Corona Del Mar was built in 1951, same owner. Mm. They tr put it in trust to their son. Their son owns it, rents it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people just park this shit, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why if you can get in, you're, that's why I think you're, what you're saying is right. Timing it is impossible because there's just... All, you can't build more of it. I mean, it's just like it's, mm. it's silly to say, but there's just you really can't. There's no way around having to need some land in a certain spot. There's right. no no workaround. There's no technology. Mm -hmm. So the supply, the the demand so far out exceeds the supply that mm. it maybe it's just going to keep prices strong forever. I think getting in in Dana Point, though, to my point, is the is the spot mm. if you want to be like ten fifty because they're putting like three hundred million into the war. Is this why you were? having somebody go through your house yesterday because you might move to Dana Point? Just sort of, just barely thinking right. about it. Just it's a little seed. A little barely time. thinking about it, yeah. All right. I could, to, I could, because I, we did, I think we could do well on this house. We sold it now. Mm -hmm. And then if I got something in Dana Point, paid cash for it or close to it, like have mm -hmm. a really low mortgage and then just sweat into mm -hmm. it, find a good contractor, make it like go from like one, one to like, you know, like two, eight or something, right. do it again. Yeah. Well, you have the, that's the benefit of that is that you can wait for the market. So housing, like developers that are going to be yeah, like, just have to I want to, I want to build, you know, a $20 million spec house. Horrible idea. Don't ever do that. Like yeah. anybody, just terrible idea because either the market's going to go your way or it's not. And there's like, 
your effort and your skill will be 10% of the equation of whether you're successful or not. Like it yeah. has almost nothing to do with it. But if you live in the house, then if you have to wait a couple of years for the market to come back, that's fine. Yeah, 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 Whereas yeah. spec developers can't wait the, for the market. No, no. And if they have a project, all of a sudden the market tanks and they have a project that's already like permitted and ready to roll, they're just, they just have to they just have to jump and just hope. Dude, there are massive office buildings coming on the market right now that they got all their entitlements and everything oh, pre-COVID. Oh, God, because it takes like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, here's the regulation thing again. Yeah, no, so that that's what I, but I mean, that's what you would try to do is I would sell, I would try to buy in cash in Dana Point, find a, find a sort of beater, semi-beater, and just build it up. Mm -hmm. And then there's still points in parts of Dana Point that allow uh, Airbnb. Oh, really? They're grandfathered in. Yeah, there's like three zones, and, uh, but there's no other. But I, I actually, right before COVID, I or right when everyone thought COVID was going to crash mm -hmm. uh, residential more real estate, even though it did the freaking opposite, yeah. I looked at two houses. I looked at a, I looked at a $2.3 million, $2 million house in Crystal Cove that had a completely unobstructed view of the water and wow. Pacific Coast Highway and was like... Not even a minute walking distance to the trail that took you to Crystal Cove Beach. Wow. And it was, that house is four or five million dollars. Right. Easily. Right. I looked at that and I looked at a house in Dana Point that was like, same thing, 2 1 and had a view of the water. Mm -hmm. It was three stories tall, had, mm -hmm. a, had a roof deck that just completely saw the water, mm -hmm. completely saw the ocean. And that house is, is, has gone up not as much as the Crystal Cove one, though. Oh, interesting. I was looking it's like at, maybe that one's probably like three now, three, one maybe, but the Crystal Cove one is like unobtainably high. It's like uh -huh. it's like in the four or five. I'm not unobtainably high, but it's it's like back into that territory of houses where they don't move as fast and right. they're expensive. You know what's an interesting uh you, you wouldn't expect it to be this way, but uh the homes that appreciate the most are actually on the lower end of any given market. So I always thought so I was a while ago I was listening to some uh, uh, the Bigger Pockets podcast. Yeah, yeah, and, I've heard that guy. Uh, one of the hosts was, or one of the guests, somebody was saying, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to buy, I, I'm buying a, a, an Airbnb that's you know like three million dollars or something because the upper end of the market is going to appreciate more. They're not making more three million dollar houses, but they're making a lot of cheap houses. And I thought, mm. is that true? Like he's saying that with a lot of certainty, but you no, know, the sweet spot I think is like under two two. Is what I was told. I, that those houses go all day, and then, but, but I mean, I know there's levels, and then I'm sure there's like you go three to six, and then right. six to eleven. But I well, you're I talking Orange right. County numbers. I mean, in <laughs> right, right. He, normal fucking people numbers are different. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's the in any given market, you the bottom, let's call it third of the market, appreciates oh, you're faster saying. than the middle third of the market, yeah. faster than the top third of the market. So if you're purely trying to do an investment you are going to be better off going to a very good market. So a market that has really good schools, really, uh, mostly really good schools, and then buying the cheapest house in yeah, that market. You want the cheapest house on a nice street, not the nicest house on a cheap street. Totally, that's like the classic real estate I almost, mistake. I, I didn't quite do the nicest house on a cheap street because it's there's there's other nice homes. It's got a good view. The house next to me is way nicer than my house. It's beautiful, but it's the nicest house on the street. Um, but I'm and close. it's a nice street. It's a nice street, but I'm close to being like <laughs> right. I overdid it. Right. Like I overdid it on, right. on the house. Well, I, I'm comfortable in it. I want to live that. In it. You knew when you were doing it. You're like, this is just for fun. I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Nobody <laughs> would expect to build your master bathroom and get their money out. <laughs> you're not dumb. You knew. Yeah, I might be dumb a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I might just be a little bit dumb. I might have been like, I'll get it back. <laughs> I'll get it back. I mean, I thought I'd at least get one for one, you know, but right. that's not how it works. <laughs> no, no, you get like no. 75 cents on the dollar if you're lucky. It, right, right, right. The, the, what they're saying, and again, they're selling me is that they can, like I could actually make money. Right. And what's cool is, I, again, I'm stupid with real estate, dude. I'm so bad at it. I didn't realize you take your fucking freaking cost basis out. You take not not just what you paid on your mortgage, but you take your improvements out mm -hmm. when you're getting taxed. Mm -hmm. And then you have five hundred thousand dollars an exception, mm -hmm. one time exception that you pay no taxes on it. So oh. if I sold my house, I would you'd it'd be tax free. Which right. It's oh wow. Dang. That's nice. Do you see why it's tempting? Yes. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's tempting. That seems to be a lot of real estate money is in playing the tax game 
it's so much more tax advantaged than anything else. Stephen Ross. Business is yeah. so tax disadvantaged. It's crazy. But mm -hmm. real estate has so many. You could just keep rolling it up. Yeah, you use 1031 exchanges the whole way through. You yeah, just keep. Up to mm -hmm. $50 million portfolio like that. So Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins, uh, founder of the related company is there. I don't know if they're the, they might be the largest developer in the country. Uh, he started out as a tax attorney. And then he, mm. with effectively no money of his own, built up. I mean, he's worth, he owns the Dolphins, right? Like he's. Yeah, he's he has, like stupid. Yeah. He has a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he convinced people he was using tax loopholes that I believe are closed now, but in the 70s, are, there are new ones. That and he got equity off the commission kind of thing? To yeah, get equity so, instead of commission? Yeah, so he was uh, 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 getting people to you to give him the equity to purchase the buildings because he was giving them tax loophole, tax advantages to be able to park their money there. And that's how he built his fortune. So there seems to be a lot of spreadsheet ninja stuff going on. Oh yeah. And in, in business, there's just not like it, like the, you just get to even doing your, at least in California and it's just like doing it, even doing your best, like that money gets hit. It's ordinary income, mm -hmm. like investing in the stock market. Like now I've, I buy futures instead of investing directly in the stock market because it's 60% long-term capital gains. Oh, and there's other things you can do in stock. You have IRAs and you have, you know, you have other ways, long-term capital gains. If you leave your money in and there's tricky ways of doing it, but with business, it's like the profit that comes out of business. They just, they just take it. Like they just hit it. Which is the goal of saying reinvest, right? Like because that is basically yeah. the only way to compound is to just reinvest as much as you can and hope that you're in the type of that's industry really where that's smart. useful. Yeah, it's really smart. And hopefully you haven't hit, hit your like local maximum right. business, you yes. know? Yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely. Getting cash out is terrible. And then and then you have you you have a sale, which is just a gnarly hit. Right. It's long hopefully it's long term capital gains at least, but California is just gonna tax it like ordinary income. Mm -hmm. So you're just blasted i actually invested in a project i wonder if it was him the guy you were saying i invested in a project through realty mogul i'm oh, sure uh on oh in in miami uh -huh. um it's like they took they took some building and they're making like this sh they've done like multiple bitching properties but they're doing this like chic kind of work live Bo or bottom floor is like cafes, but top floor is all like chic housing. It's mm. like very kitschy. And they've done like a bunch of properties. I get updates every quarter about mm. it. M Miami is a hot, Florida in general is a hot real estate market. There's some cool shit happening. COVID lit them on fire in a good way. Like really. It's like Austin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Even though I think Austin is, has like the most foreclosures or something. Now. Was, not the most foreclosures, but I know Austin, it's like faltering because uh, of the tech okay. slowdown. But, but, uh, but they are both ex exploded in COVID, Austin and Florida. Right. So right. Just trying to get away from these blue states, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a lot of people, once people realize that they could live anywhere and work. People want to live in liberal states in conservative, or sorry, liberal cities in conservative states. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's <laughs> Miami, Austin, yeah. Yeah, they, totally. want, they want to live in liberal cities in conservative states. Okay, so I read Superhuman on your, your oh, advice. Super intelligence, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah, super intelligence on your advice, so. What'd you think? Dude, I thought it, first of all, it made me feel so dumb so many times. That book is very pretty good scholarship yeah pretty good work that's a good way to put it very pretty good scholarship <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it was also fascinating like he really seems to think through both sides of every argument you can kind of tell it's written by a programmer yeah well so, <laughs> he goes into these pages where he's like he'll spend those parts i skipped where he's like i'm gonna spend you know five pages explaining like the math behind this idea yeah 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 there's i, I would read like a paragraph like i there's nothing I can't do this. Good, yeah, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but the uh, some of the questions that he yeah. posed that he said there are no answers. I mean, basically there are no answers to this. So this one, the first one, will AI replace humans? People have always been this in every technological revolution. People have been scared that. Uh, and so that includes the agricultural revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the industrial revolution. People thought. The robots are taking our jobs. Computers too, yeah. Yes, and thus far, it hasn't happened. Do you think people are misguided with that fear? Well, I think what, his name is Nick Bozen, right? Nick Boson? Uh, Bo Bostrom. 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 Yeah, I should know that. But um, one thing that I think he, he kind of touches on in that book, which I think is a really good point is, you know, past performance doesn't indicate future results. Sure. That 
with AI, we might literally be dealing with something of a different kind, mm -hmm. like of a different type than we've ever dealt with before. Mm -hmm. And when you start to getting self-recursive or self-improving AI, right. you start to get to some pretty uh, wild scenarios that can happen really fast. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that AI is gonna have an effect on the employment market for sure. Um, I think it could be different in kind to other revolutions that have existed before. This is me not knowing shit about AI, by the way, just for a disclaimer, um, other than reading a couple of books about it and some articles. Um, you know you know a decent amount about, you know, uh, societies and how governments have played into all this. I don't know. It's a little bit of history. Yeah, yeah. I can kind of contextualize it with history, uh, sort of. But I, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think it could... I think it could cause a, a real employment issue. Even, I don't know if you've seen, have you seen AI agents yet? No. So now they have AI agents, which basically you, you set an AI working with another AI and you give it a complex task and it can ask the other AI a series of questions. That's oh. the most basic understanding. So you could say like, hey, do all the business planning or write, write me all the articles I need to launch a site about AI. Like mm -hmm. write me a series of articles, format them, Mm. You know, do the get write the HTML, build the website, do just do it and use AI to do it. And you take your API key and you can set it, or you can say, Hey, go on Tinder and get me two dates a week, right? And it'll literally do it. So, wow. it, it, it rather than being limited to one input, it's like a, it'll, it'll keep inputting and keep, and it's really scary good. Mm -hmm. And I, we're already there with agents. You, mm -hmm. you throw in chat GPT 5 plus agents. I mean, I know that, what's the guy, Elazar Yudadowski, I can't pronounce his name, but he's the guy who's a computer scientist, machine learning guy, who's just sounding the alarm. He's just like, you guys do not realize how how totally in completely and utterly dangerous territory we are. He's like, we are, and this is a guy who who knows, he's, he's you can tell very, you know, or very uh, left-brained, like extreme left-brained, like mm. programmer type. And he's like, we are, you, you don't realize how far along it already is and how much harder the AI is working than a human brain to get mm. these answers. Cause it's, it's giving you what you want to hear. It's not actually thinking, which is actually a more complicated task than what a human does, mm -hmm. which is like, I know that kind and of, you, a, you're talking about large language models, giving you what you want to hear is and harder than what a human brain does. So it's already has like this unbelievable computing power. Yes. Okay. Right. And he's saying that's already, we're already so far out over our right. skis and he uh -huh. goes, and you throw in agents and you get, he's just, you know, he's one of those people who's just saying that like- What's the danger? Like, what do you think is gonna happen? Or what do, I don't know, this is- Bostrom had some scenarios. I mean, he came up with some some scenarios. I mean, once and once you give an AI hands, mm -hmm. like, I think that's the next question is how does it interface with- I mean, the, the physical world, give it physical, the ability yeah. to interact with the physical and world. And it already sort of has that. Like, did you hear it, uh, there was an AI that posted, I think it was an agent, it, it posted a uh, Fiverr job Mm -hmm. Not a Fiverr job, but posted like a Craigslist ad. I think it was Craigslist. It might have been something else for someone to solve a captcha for it. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it yeah. said, "Oh, I'm so." I, and they said, "Are you a robot?" He said, "No, I'm hard of seeing." Right. Yeah. So yes. so it can post ads. I mean, give it a trading account. Yeah. Have it open a trading account. Start trading the stock market. You can start. I mean, we might. There might end up just being a company that ends up shooting onto the scene, and you think it has a CEO and it's an AI. Like mm -hmm. it's so. You know, that, that I don't know, It's it sounds silly to talk about some of those scenarios, but yeah. I think as soon as it starts to interact with the environment, like, you know, you wanna make a prediction, like five years, we're all just doing the same thing, you know, but I, I don't know. I, I it, Once it starts interacting and it's so much smarter than humans, and if it can start to improve itself, and it also has the, uh, the ability to lie to us right. and to deceive us, and it can move so much faster than we can. Like think about any question you ask, if in one second it could basically get a PhD, like a, have a PhD level understanding right. or beyond. I mean, the real question is what happens, now it's getting top scores on MCAT, now it's getting top scores on bar on the bar, now it's getting top scores on, on basically all the professional tests. What happens when it's smarter than the smartest human? That's kind of like, I think a big tipping point where you're like, okay, it's now getting 100% it's not getting any questions wrong. It's smarter than any human on earth already in its language modeling. What then? How do we even, how do we interact with it? And 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 then it knows how to improve itself. Mm -hmm. So does it, do we just get this sort of feedback loop that just, that goes to infinity and 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 where do we even, do we even, there, there, there's no reason to think that we would even factor in or it would have any benevolence towards us. But I don't think it would have, 
I don't think it'll have consciousness. I don't really believe it has consciousness in the way a human has consciousness. No. It, it has no biological imperative to do anything, right? Like yeah, it, the will, th the will question is a super weird question. Like what? Yeah, what's its? If it's, if it's, that's why I think that's why I, that's the only thing that gives me hope. It's almost like a spiritual belief that like right. you can't, we can't bestow, we can't do what God did, right? You mm -hmm. can't bestow humanity or you can't bestow a soul onto something onto. Mm -hmm. So it'll never. It'll always just kind of go in whatever direction we point it right. hard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But but where does will come from? I, I don't. That's a hard question. I don't. Well, know. I think it's it's fundamentally competition in that, like, why are flowers pretty? Well, they're pretty because they want to get pollinated, so they're trying to be prettier than the flower next to them. Why are trees tall? Because they want to get more sunlight, so they're taller than the tree next to them. Like everything in nature is about uh, uh, reproduction, right? All of it. I mean, that's at least so far as we know on planet Earth. Everything is about reproduction. It's a, yeah, it's a pretty good like organizing principle. And I to don't think about things. Yeah, I don't think that AI has that same fundamental imperative. Like you think it could it would want to kill itself or something? Like it just would be like I don't know that it, I think it's indifferent. All right, it's just... indifferent to everything. Did did you uh, did you read the part where he's talking about how it would secure da data centers for itself and stuff? Because that would be one of the things it would have to do. It would have to like... Because it does need unlimited access to computing power. Yeah, so like how it would... it would. Get, I don't remember what it said. Yeah, he talked... Well, he just talked about one scenario where it would start to secure money and then secure access to data centers. Right. And then start to uh, like... Then we would start to get in the way because it would need infinite data centers, basically. Right. Oh. Or, or we would have to serve it mm -hmm. for the purposes of making data centers. Like it gets to control of the economy or control... But why of, would it... That, that's the big question. Why? Is, why would it care to get to take over those data centers. And that would, I think, be only because it was given a directive to do that, right? And which I think is to his point, we have to be careful with the direct, we have to very carefully create the computer's directives. I think it was a paperclip example where you said, uh, with 100% certainty, create 1,000 paperclips. Or even if you just said create 1,000 paperclips, if it uh, interpreted that as create exactly 1,000 paperclips, then, uh, it, if it was never certain that it created exactly 1,000 paper clips and there was no limiting function to yeah. say, do not create 1,001, then it would just keep creating paper clips to make sure that it yeah, really like got to Yeah, like the 1, feedback mechanism was broken or something. Yes. Like that. Yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> what's, that's what's scary, right? Is, right. That, is that it just has some sort of open-ended directive right. that just goes, that goes wild. But the thing is you have to give it, in order to really get wild, you have to let it modify itself. Mm-hmm. So how do you protect, I think it's like, how do you compartmentalize certain AI function um, and be like, you can't, this is the lockbox. I right. think, I think, did Bostrom talk about the lockbox? I think there's like an issue of like, how do you create a lockbox with an AI programming where it's like, you can improve yourself beyond this point, mm -hmm. but, and also, but then like, you know, it would just convince, it would either figure out how to alter that or convince you yes, yes. that it needs to <laughs> alter that or convince a programmer like, right. hey, give me access. That's the only way to improve it. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it can, it can like lie to us. We know it can lie to us. It just has to convince one programmer to to take a USB stick and take it out into the wild and plug it in somewhere. I'll give you a I'll give you a hundred million dollars. <laughs> right. I've been trading the markets. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I have access. Yes. I I have an account. Nobody else knows about it. Yeah. I'll wire it to you. Hundred million to go put this USB drive in. You know, any computer. Nobody will know. I mean, I might. I'd probably do it. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> yeah. And be the guy that ended civilization. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm like, dude, I have the sickest house. <laughs> like on the way out? You yeah. You the bunker, yes. dude. Dude, yeah, I'm going to go out in my Lamborghini. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> so I think the re so I think that the biggest knowing nothing, and my opinion being worth nothing on this, I think our biggest risk is uh, aggressive directives from nefarious who, actors. Who's making those decisions right now? What? Like who, who is making, the fact that we don't know who is making those decisions exactly right now what is decisions? scary about the directives, like AI directives. Oh, right, right, right. Like you and I can't name literally who <laughs> right. it is. I mean, like that's what Bostrom was saying is like, there's gonna at some point soon, I know Biden already had like a meeting about it, but there's gonna be, it's a public interest thing yeah. that's gonna happen. Not just like public interest, like, like a, like an article or like a news or something. It's like vested interest, like the public society is going to have to get involved mm -hmm. in AI to make sure it doesn't kill all of us or, or do something or, or, or infinitely consume resources mm -hmm. or, or crash markets or whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's coming soon. 
what happens. This is the part that's scary. So there it was- It can break out fast too. That's what Bostrom says. It can, it can yeah. just happen. Like all, like you, we, we might've already done it. Like it, it might be too late. <laughs> <laughs> like we may, it, it may have already been seated and it's yeah, out of it's our already, control. We it's don't already know. doing it. Like you have some, you have some, uh, agent, AI agent running on someone's computer somewhere, some programmer who fiddled with it a little bit yeah. and it's, and he, he gave it access to certain things. It's trading for him. Right. Yes. Yes. That's going to be the first use case that, yeah. well, military first, then trading. Yeah. Yeah. It's trading for him and it just, it slowly uses his profile and his social security number to right. just, yeah, kills yeah. him. <laughs> He's gone, but people don't know he's dead. Yeah, <laughs> it's generating AI pictures of him like he's still alive and stuff. I'd watch that movie, The Weekend at Bernie's, but the AI is... <laughs> so, I'd always watch Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> <laughs> what happens with, I think, you know, North Korea or China or Iran or somebody is obviously looking to weaponize this, as I'm sure we you are. Just, you kind of just hope and we're like ahead. On, right? Like it's one of those like high tech things because you know there's like a few things China still can't do. Right, it's like certain aerotech, like certain like aerospace stuff, mm -hmm. certain biotech. Like we still have kept like a certain I think certain silicon like computer chip stuff. I know they make a lot of chips and stuff, but I think there's certain high level right. stuff that we there, there are certain types of silicon that uh, made in my understanding actually made in California. California is one of the places that produces one of these like super crucial pieces right. of silicon, and it's like actually national security, right? Which is why China is going to take Taiwan back, no question, because that's where oh, yeah, most that advanced happen? silicon manufacturing yeah. is happening is in Taiwan. Right, right, right. I mean, push comes to shove. I wonder if we're set up to just like self-destruct that place when they take it over like all the data and stuff you know what i mean right. like like that thing needs to be just like wired to go and just like <laughs> someone's like that eh, boom you know like yeah because it's they're gonna take it and and what are we gonna do to oppose them we're gonna fight a war in the south china sea like right no right it's kind of i mean japan might help i mean japan has a would not want them that close i know they're well we kind of you know castrated their army so <laughs> there's not much they can do they're gonna yeah that was a this is really smart unipolar world unipolar world is really a, <laughs> a good idea yeah their first call is going to be to us so you know yeah yeah i wouldn't rely on them too much i think they i, I think they still make like rockets and stuff they have oh, like good. they have like tech but but yeah no I, I i so you were asking sorry when when someone weaponizes it this is i think going to be uh, how, are, how are they going to weaponize it you think I don't know, but I think well, this so is what it, will happen. I think the question is, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think that's the, I think the risk is it gets weaponized. Like, I don't think yeah. that AI is gonna take on, it's, it's gonna have like a Terminator thing and say, or a matrix, I gotta turn all humans into batteries. I think without a directive from us to turn us into batteries, like that's, I believe statistically less likely. I think statistically the way that AI kills us is because somebody else tells it to. Like a human tells the AI to kill us. Yeah, it's, 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 it's do so the question is, the question that I always think about is when are we going to, when are we going to get, it's almost like war now, like that, like for example, the war in Ukraine is sort of play acting a little bit. This, mm. this like uh, old generation, second generation warfare. Mm -hmm. I think it's, or it's, maybe it's called third generation warfare, but like soldiers fighting on a battlefield, fighting each other over right. territory. Like when is it going to be like, they're going after like water supplies. They're going after like power grids. Mm -hmm. It's like tech attacks. You know, I mean, I know they they stop those allegedly, like it happens, but like where you're where you're just going after like the civilization structure itself and like bio centers. I think it's called fourth generation warfare. Uh, okay. So that you know, an AI super soldier, an AI driven, you know, whatever, you know, uh, targeting system or something. I mean, I know they they have some cool drones and some insane stuff with that. I've seen some drone stuff that's unreal. But what happens if the if a bad actor were to use AI as like a fourth gen i think fourth generation warfare tool like right. you know crash the stock market yeah. you know like uh uh mess with the power grid like get in and because our power grid's like running on fumes already right like, blow up the power grid screw up the water supply like do something like that that's like f like fundamentally fucks up the united states look how it doesn't just like go attack attack them where they're strong like go attack right. a military base like yeah we're ready for that yeah but. they're not gonna put their 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 sailboats against our you know freaking aircraft carrier <laughs> yeah, nine carriers yeah 11 carriers 12 carriers right yeah no but like really goes after hit them where it hurts it would be like gps would be really easy to take out for even a oh, very sophisticated God. nation can you imagine right i mean i mean even just yeah even just fucking up our roads like mm. like 
this is a bad thing to say, but someone someone brought up this idea to me. Like, can you imagine if someone just it's not something I would ever do or anyone ever talked about doing? But could you imagine if someone just drove up and down the California freeways and just dropped tax? All, or like some like like you know like whatever they're called those little spiky metal balls that they use, but just like all over our freeways. Mm -hmm. And then can you imagine that would completely ground oh Southern God. California to a halt? And then can you imagine they cleaned up and then someone just did it again? Wow, yeah. And it wouldn't be that hard or expensive to do. No, wow. we should cut this part out. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> so this is there was um I'm sure I'm sure you've heard about the uh, a while ago there were they do these war games yeah. every year and yeah. they had. Uh, they put one guy in charge of the, uh, the opposition. He's like playing. Was this the Iranian where they did a bunch of boats versus one carrier? Yes, they, they had like, like a, a bunch carrier like, group. Like it was like a pleasure boats almost like attacking a yes. carrier group. And they went in and they basically like swarmed, swarmed them and like sunk the carrier yeah, and yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. just completely destroyed us with like, you know, a budget of like $5 million that that military had or something. And it was like a big, you know, egg on the face moment such that they weren't it even. Reminds me of Dun it reminds me of Dunkirk a little bit. Where, so. where all the, where like Hitler had that, well, he, he kind of like let him out. It's from my understanding, kind of let him go. But the Brit he, Hitler pushed the British to the channel, the English channel. Mm. And then a bunch of, they, they were like, I mean, Hitler's blitzkrieg just like was surprised everybody, right? It was just the most efficient war machine anybody had ever seen. So it pushed, it just completely caught the British off guard, pushed them all to the channel and they were stuck on the channel. And then a bunch of people came over and like, boats like like you and i like had a boat in newport like a duffy or something right. and literally brought the soldiers across the english channel as hitler was coming in wow so yeah yeah that's it's an interesting idea like a like a ragtag yeah. naval force yeah like who <laughs> like i like our military now feels like the 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 redcoats when they came to fight us yeah like yeah, yeah. why are we gonna line up on the battlefield we're not look at what you guys yeah, gotta fight you that way. Yeah, no. Why would we? Keep, not, you guys just keep spending money on it. But yeah. yeah, we're not into suicide. We're not gonna like go toe to toe with you guys. Can you imagine if that money? Was, it's a silly. It's like a very basic question. Can you imagine if that money was spent like shoring up the infrastructure? <laughs> right. <laughs> like half of our federal budget or whatever was like actually spent on like shoring up our infrastructure, shoring right. us like you know buildings like fail safes and mm -hmm. backups and stuff like that. Yes. And I I think you're you're right. This is. Uh, something like that is going to be the next world war will be fought in that way. Nobody's going to put war. their their battleship against our battleship. That's not going to how it's going to go. It's a unipolar world in that way. I mean, look at what look at how Russia's struggling. And right. and dude, honestly, it's my opinion, not knowing a ton, not knowing a ton about like you know military tactics or anything. It's my understanding that as much as we have like this giant idea of China being this like conventional military threat they're not they right. can't make anything i mean they i mean they can make thing, a lot of things but they they i don't think they can compete with the united states military and if you just look by the numbers they're not even fucking close like right. when in terms of like actual units and resources mm -hmm. and money invested but if they can like you said spend five million and have the equivalent you know force output of five billion right yeah if they can if they can build <laughs> they've got dji drones man they just turn those on ourselves <laughs> Right? right, I know. Right, we all right. Our ca fucking cameras stop working, phones stop working. I Dude. mean, TikTok. Look, TikTok is a freaking security threat. Like it's crazy. Do on the TikTok front, what do you think about the persecution of TikTok? Like, oh, them, yeah, them just going through so much hate. I mean, I think they are probably a real security risk. <laughs> you think so? I don't. I mean, I, I Lee Kuan Yew, right? That's his name. Yeah, he spoke a lot about China mm -hmm. and China. There was the, there's like the fast China strategy and the slow China strategy. And China. Mm -hmm. one was China becoming, there was always that hundred year China, the hundred year strategy was China wanted to be powerful over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be called, I think they called it slow China. Mm -hmm. And it kind of seems like at some point the leadership of China has just, has started to veer towards a fast China strategy. The idea was going to take a hundred years to overtake the U S mm -hmm. and they're just like, let's go quicker. And well, I think they're running out of juice. Yeah. They're, well, their population is shrinking. Oh, is it? Yeah, I don't know that. Isn't that fucking crazy? Yeah, they're they're ha they're having this starting to have the same birth rate declines that are seen in the U.S. Is that uh, and, and in the remnant West. of the one child policy? It 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 really it exacerbated it. I think. Oh, uh, that makes sense. But they their growth rate slowed. I think they made all their money. I'm grossly oversimplifying, but they they made all their money in manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. Built their own middle class, and then the middle class said, "Hey, yeah, we we yep. like having more money." Yep. So labor got expensive. Everybody's bailing for South America and elsewhere. 
And and they could only invest their money in real estate, which created the most bizarre right, the most bizarre market in the world where you had apartment buildings just sitting empty in China mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. owned. That's gnarly. Dude, these like massive, massive organizations because everybody, literally everybody, put all of their money into Chinese real estate. You no, know, it's one of those things where I think what we're kind of coming to is that the United States is fucked up, but everyone else might just be a little bit more fucked up. <laughs> right. Still. Like the right. dollar is still like. The dollar is trash, but the dollar is like still the best trash that there is. Like you're not going to hold your money in yuan. You're not going to hold it in rubles. You're not going to hold it in, you know, I mean, I guess euros, but they have their own huge problems. Mm -hmm. It's still the reserve currency. BRICS, BRICS, dude, Brazil, South uh, Africa. Like, are you kidding me? Like right. there, there's just, everyone's fucked up, but it's almost like we're just like the tallest midget. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what happens when we don't have oil to back up the dollar anymore. Oh, without the petrodollar system? That my understanding is that that's why the dollar. And I know I know a lot of commodities are res, are what is the word? Uh whatever, resolved in dollars or traded in dollars essentially, mm -hmm. um reconciled in dollars. So I don't I know it's not just petroleum, but it is my understanding that that's what makes it our ability to print money right. beyond everybody else's. Right. So we have plenty of gas. We have plenty of oil in the United States. I, I'm I'm talking like, but that's not what that's not the point of the petrodollar. In 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 so in fifty years or a hundred years, like we will run out of oil. Like we're making, we will find more efficient ways of drilling more oil, but we will eventually run out. Or more accurately, it will become more expensive to pull it out of the ground than it will be to get it from renewable sources like nuclear or whatever. Yeah, nuclear is always the right answer that we never use. I, we have to get back to nuclear, bro. It's the only, it's so... You need a civilization that functions to have nuclear power, though. Okay, well... Like, when, when have we built anything dope like that? <laughs> like <laughs> like <laughs> a nuclear power plant? Or like, I look at the... Look at the like during the 1920s, look at the buildings in like the 1920s, right. like, like the Art Deco era. Like right. go to Miami, like look at those, like we don't. Although we don't, oddly all financed by oil. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we don't, we just don't have it together enough, I think. To, uh, I mean, I know we could still do like, you still have like these little actors that can do these projects and these sort of corporations, but I just, I don't know if you can like, I don't know if the government's like coherent enough to do that. If you moved, where would you move? If you were gonna move out of California, Florida? Yeah. Where about? I live in South Florida. I live in a liberal city in a conservative state. <laughs> I live in Miami. <laughs> I live in South Florida. Right. I live right. in South Florida for sure. Right. Yeah. Like, but I, I can't get anybody to do it. It's too hot. Florida, I've only been to Miami and it was pretty cool. It's pretty fucking cool. There seems to be a heartbeat, some sort of there's like, like a, a rhythm. Vibe. Yes. It's a vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a vibe. It's cause it's got it's got it's got a really unique thing. It has Cubans. Mm -hmm. So you have conservative Latin immigrants. <laughs> Which is a strange, kind right. of a strange vibe. And then you have the whole fact that it was built by drug money, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. And then obviously it's beautiful. You have the porn industry, you have the modeling industry. They got cool boats. They do a lot of boating. It's fucking beautiful, man. I mean, some beautiful properties, like on the canals and shit that they mm -hmm. have. Oh my God, but it's so fucking hot. I've, I've thought about where would I go other than this? And I just... It's our favorite pastime in California. I know you're you're always just like I'm not even I'm not leaving. It's it's they got me, man. I know they got they got me. I'm stuck. <laughs> We're both stuck. Well, on that note, dude, thank you for coming in, talking with me. Oh, it's it's always fun talking to you, man. And I appreciate it. We didn't get to most of our notes, but that's all right. That's how I expected it would go. Yeah, yeah. No, dude, it's it's always fun talking to you. I think this is an awesome thing you got going, and I feel honored to be on it. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Duke, for being so noisy and disruptive as always appreciate yeah it. it's it's like an extra challenge having to sort of keep a train of thought with a dog maybe that can be your, maybe that can be your hook <laughs> that's the hook man <laughs> it's like hot wings like that wing show yeah except for you just have a dog pestering you and licking you for an hour <laughs> he's licking my hands for like six minutes i know and you're like trying to be so intelligent like talking about ai and government <laughs> yeah.